Hi, welcome everybody. It's six o'clock and welcome to our April book talk. Um, the first of a pair of talks on uh, New York's Great Avenue, Fifth Avenue. Uh, tonight we have Mosette Broderick, and I know we have plenty of Mosette fans and students in the audience tonight. Uh, and Mosette is a clinical professor at NYU in the Department of Art History, um, where she's taught for many years, but not as many years as she's been working on this book, which is kind of a life's work. And um, I'm going to get out of the way very quickly with after a quick introduction, uh, because uh, Mosette is going to take us both up Fifth Avenue and through time uh, in order to talk about the development of um, the streetscape, of the built environment, and of the changing social fabric of New York as well. Mosette is very well equipped to do this because um, her previous books on the Villard Houses uh, on Madison Avenue and on, uh, on McKimmead and White in a book called Triumvirate uh, with the long and, and very um, uh, encompassing title of uh, McKimmead and White Architect Art, Architecture, Scandal and Class in America's Golden Age. And she covers in great detail and in breadth um, the same sort of issues of the Gilded Age of uh, in, the, in a, a, a language as graceful and gracious as that period was. So um, I'm, very delighted to welcome Mosette tonight. We will indulge in um, in the Gilded Age and in the glorious residential architecture with Mosette. So, Mosette, I'm grateful to you. And Carol and I go way back to just about the time I started doing this many, many years ago. Uh, uh, at, when we were students at Columbia, I, I got onto this idea fairly quickly thereafter, when New York City's architectural community discovered the wonderful world of municipal records. Boy, did that open up the possibilities of what we could do. Okay, so what happened here? What was Fifth Avenue about? Believe it or not, and I had no such idea when I started this, it was really the magnet that pulled Manhattan to the north. When we start the 19th century, New York City is cozily set up right around the port. There's some 50 families in New York City who are the merchants of the port, who kind of run the port. Nobody is very, very rich. Nobody is very important. It's a small community. And then two factors change. Factor one is the Erie Canal, a remarkable breath of life as it brings goods to come into the all year round port of New York and the widening possibilities of immigration coming into the port, which to go along with what Carol just said, frees women up because it brings in lots of people who can build buildings and lots of people who will work in houses, thus freeing wives of people who will become wealthy so that they can indulge in their own practices of social advancement. So the pressures of the lower part of Manhattan pushed uh, the New York mercantile families up out of St. John's uh, uh, Square down where the Holland Tunnel is today, then up to Bond Street and Lafayette Street, but that wouldn't contain the growth of the city at the time. And some avenue, some way to move to the north needed to be done. And the two possibilities were to go up Second Avenue or to go up Fifth Avenue, both wide, 100 foot wide avenues that have a sturdy rock base so that they are safe enough to build on. And why not Second Avenue? That's where the Stuyvesants, that's where the old Dutch were. The Sty that's where Second Avenue is where the old merchants and the Knickerbockers of New York were. And they didn't go there. They went across the newly laid out Washington Square and up on Fifth Avenue. Why? Probably because the Stuyvesants still own so much land around uh, the Second Avenue site that other Builders couldn't see much hope for themselves, the Stuyvesants owned it all. Fifth Avenue had a little property owned by the Gravorts, a minor Dutch family, but the rest of it was free and open. And so everything comes up to Fifth Avenue and it starts out very slowly uh, on the Gravort property in the 1830s. Okay, what was New York like? New York was a Dutch city. In fact, Albany had been the real capital of old New Amsterdam, and then early New York. Because of the port, the Amsterdam families came to New York and absorbed with them the New England families who were very active in the ports of New Newport and Boston, 
but had the misfortune to have winter there. And so the Yankees from the ports in the north came down and joined the Dutch, and they had a very interesting society. They all became Knickerbockers. Uh, yeah, they left the Knicker they left the Dutch church. Uh, they all went to the Episcopal church. But uh, the customs and habits of the Dutch won. So these 50 families of the old Knickerbockers, which included the Yankees, uh, had a very tight society and a tight society of rather, rather great charm. There wasn't, we weren't very rich. They didn't have much pretension. They had simple customs. Their idea of a big day was to eat ginger snap cookies. And sometimes the young people who hadn't married off yet would sort of dance with each other on the outer edges of Washington Square Park. So what we saw was a pretty simple life. It was a conformist life too. Everybody lived in red brick brownstones, or I'm sorry, red brick houses. And everybody had the same furniture, the same utensils, the same everything. There were customs that nobody broke. You got a new dress. You didn't wear it for two years. That was showy. So you put it in a box for two years. Uh, you didn't do Christmas because the Dutch didn't. They did this New Year's Day where every woman of any importance in the city made a big alcohol-laden punch. And all the men came all dressed up and drank the punch and got themselves sloshed, I'm sure. Uh, and so these customs endured. So conformity was the game. We're going to see as the magnet of Fifth Avenue drags the city northward, a block a year was the usual pace. And as this happened, we're going to see it totally changes around the Civil War when there are changes in society and the conformity bit doesn't work anymore. Okay, uh, so this is Washington Square and the one, it was laid up as a military parade ground. Uh, it really looks as if it's having a bad day on the box of, on, on the top of a box of candy to me. Uh, but this is the sort of Knickerbocker uh, society of the day. They're all watching them look like toy, toy soldiers as they perform their marches in the empty Washington Square. Here's what the houses that most people would have been living in at the time. Red brick Georgian or federal houses, which abounded in lower Manhattan. We, of course, have saved absolutely none of them. Uh, so the none left, but this is what it would have looked like. Uh, so uh, this is kind of the convention that we see when they start uh, the uh, rise to the north. Now, the route across the city from 2nd to 5th Avenue came across the top of the park where where there was this wonderful uh, set of buildings, pretty much still there, partially still there, which are which is known as the Row at Washington Square North. Uh, these were wonderful 13 houses, uh, which emerged in a newer style, skipped the red brick, but they kind of put a Grecian portico on the houses. So they're kind of updating it. Uh, and this is where a group of new businessmen were coming in to join the Knickerbockers. And these were Scottish born uh, businessmen who came to New York and had a very small but very effective society. Okay. Uh, the, the march up Fifth Avenue started with this house. This is Heinrich Brevoort's own house, and this begins a tradition of something I call anchor baby houses. That's because to start the real estate market going for their properties, for their empty lots, they put their most eligible child in a house on the site. And so in the early 1830s, this is the first house on Fifth Avenue on 9th Street. Uh, the Brevoort family was smart enough to bring in the best architect of the day. This is A.J. Davis. It's a very nice house. You can see it doesn't have a big stoop. You can see it as a central doorway, and you can see it as a bow on its uh, flanking side. This was very unusual uh, for the day, but unfortunately for the Brevoorts, it didn't work. The properties nearby didn't sell. There were a lot of gaps and a lot of time as this part of lower Manhattan gradually began to fill. And as this happened, two new seismic changes came in, a new material and a new style. The new material was Belleville, New Jersey brownstone, easily uh, cut just across the harbor in the north of New Jersey and brought over to clad the buildings. Essentially, the row houses were the same row house. They just now had a veneer of brownstone. And the style changes too. 
The style becomes the style of West London, the style then being developed in West London in the areas around the V&A Museum, Holland Park in that area. And that is an Italianate style, which also has some reflection on that clubs of London's Pall Mall, which we'll see reflected in the building up here in a few minutes. So new style, new material, but there's still gaps. Not everybody follows the Brevorts and a few others to the to the street, even though it had a wonderful amenity. These houses had a very large front yard, which was effectively planted in the good weather. They had a big backyard, their own backyard. They also had little private parks on the big slide you see on the right in between the three houses you're looking at and the uh, uh, Rein, uh, Reinhardt house just to the south. Uh, you see a big park and that was part of the family's house. They had little parks and lots of greenery, which made lower Manhattan particularly splendid. And eventually it's going to work. Eventually, we're going to see the brownstones climb up, the churches of highest society, that is the Episcopalians and the Scottish-born Presbyterian people, uh, come in and plant a church at 11th and 12th streets. Uh, and we see the first French mansard roof come in here with this house uh, on 10th Street. And then we come across this. What the world is this? Uh, this is the house of James Lennox. James Lennox was one of those Scottish families. His father was a merchant, came, came over here from Scotland early, uh, what am I talking about, late in the 18th century, uh, made a great deal of money, uh, produced a son and a daughter, Henrietta, his sister, and uh, James Lennox lived in this house that James Lennox will build uh, on 12th Street in a sort of Scottish style. We know he was a bookophile. We know he loved Scottish materials. We know he loved Walter Scott. And my thought always was he was trying to echo Walter Scott with his enormous house. It was actually his house, his sister's house is just to the north, but it was actually 75 feet across uh, this wonderful house in which he lived all by himself. It was just James Lennox and his books and a few servants who were loyal to him where did he get the idea for the house? I think from the nearby University of the City of New York, which is NYU before it changed its name. And I think it's the Dakin early long gone uh, NYU main building that you're looking at here. That was probably the architect for James Lennox's own house. Lennox we're going to run into again because as he begins to age and has this 30,000 book library, he begins to think what's gonna to happen to it. He's a lonely man. He's going to create the Lennox library that we are going to be visiting on a little piece of property his father bought and told him to never sell. It's called Lennox Hill. It is the properties of 70th to 73rd streets, fifth over to the east. So an enormous property. Lennox did not himself sell it and he built his library there. Okay, so this is still pretty conformist. Everybody's still wearing the same clothes. They're still buying the same stuff. Everybody's still in the same picture. And in comes this man. This is August Belmont, uh, German board, representing the Rothschilds, comes here uh, and supposed to go to Cuba to look after the Rothschild interests in the sugar plantations of Cuba. But he smelled something when he got off the boat here in uh, uh, 1837, and he stayed on. Now, we see him as the costume wearing person of the day, one of the pastimes that starts about this, about the 1830s and 40s is the costume ball. It then goes out of style because a couple of lopes and there's all sorts of social problems. So we give that one up. It comes back big time in the 1880s in the Gilded Age. But here we see August Belmont all dressed up uh, to go to a ball where he was invited. Why was he invited? Because he had the wisdom to marry well. August Belmont married a daughter of the nautical admiralty, the Perry family. In fact, his father-in-law is going to open up trade with Japan just a few years after he marries Caroline Perry. So what we see is his conversion to the Episcopal faith, production of six children, building of a very nice house. There we go, uh, by, by a, a British born architect, which you see here. Why exactly? It's a brick house. Uh, it's very staid, it's very conventional. It's very beautiful, I think, in its proportions. Why it has two entrance porticos uh, more extended than usual in, the, in a New York City house, I don't know. And behind it is the ballroom, one of the first independent ballrooms uh, on, a new, on a house in America. 
So uh, he sets himself up as the king of Fifth Avenue. And what he does is convince his wife to wear new dresses when she gets them, to go to the opera and sit through it. And she was kind of the society queen, well-bred, well-mannered, polite, charming. She was the society queen here, you see her, uh, of New York through the Civil War. So Belmont had created a place for himself within society, thanks to his marriage and to his wonderful wife. She was known as Tiny Belmont, who we see here. Uh, and they bring wine, balls, pictures on the walls of the rooms in the houses, even if Belmont didn't have particularly good eye for paintings. Uh, we see him change the fashion of New York. In fact, there's a wonderful book about Belmont, which refers to him as the king of Fifth Avenue. As we move up the avenue, uh, we see this one moment, an intrusion on the domestic life of Fifth Avenue. We're looking at the semi-completed uh, Madison Square, and just across from it, you see the Fifth Avenue Hotel, the first really big grand hotel in New York. It stretched between 23rd and 20, uh, sorry, yeah, 23rd and 24th Streets. It is said to have had 400 rooms. It is said to have had bathrooms in the rooms, unheard of in most hostelries to this point. It is a house that was, it is a hotel that was said to have cost a million dollars, according to the British architectural periodical, The Building News. And Edward VII, on the first visit of a royal figure to the United States, stayed and played leapfrog in the halls of the Fifth Avenue Hotel. The hotel also provided a uh, dining room where the guests in the hotel could bring uh, their own guests at no extra charge, and where they got four meals a day served at long tables so that people got to talk to each other. Going just off Fifth Avenue for a minute is a man who in one sense creates a great deal of the lure of Fifth Avenue, but a block away from Madison Avenue. This is Leonard Jerome, uh, a gambler, really. Uh, he's said to be a stock uh, marker uh, whiz, but he was really just playing a gambler. He hit it big with Erie Rail in 1859 and came to New York City uh, out from Brooklyn where he'd been living and built this house. Okay, first really outstanding looking house. Look at it. It's brick. It's next to a regular conventional brownstone. It's got all this iron trim. Boy, we know this guy was important, except he never hit it big again. His love and in the far view of the house, uh, his stable appears there. He had three great loves in his life. Horses, wine, and women who sang. Eventually, this got to be too much for his wife, who picked up their three daughters and moved to France and then over to England. And many of you may know that his middle daughter marries Lord Randolph Churchill, thus producing Winston Churchill. The Paul Mall reference, clubs. Clubs began in private houses, but when the Union Club, the first major club in New York City, when it began, it outgrew pretty quickly its ordinary row house premises. And having a dining room with portable toilets nearby did not create happy moments for the diners in the row house configuration. And so in 1855, a British-born architect built this building in the manner of Paul Mall on 23rd Street. And what we're doing, or 21st Street rather, and what we're doing is looking south down Fifth Avenue and you can see the greenery and the openness of the day. It's also in this Renaissance style we were speaking of, the clubs of Paul Mall. Uh, what other institutions? So we've got churches, we've got the clubs coming to Fifth Avenue. What else came to Fifth Avenue? Restaurants. This is Delmonico's, which was the first sort of fancy, uh, people ate at home. Uh, this was the sort of first fancy restaurant in New York City. It moved three times, 14th Street to 26th Street to 44th Street. Uh, and here we see it in its 26th Street place. This is where men went to dinner. Men might also take women, but women did not dine in any public place until probably the public rooms at the Waldorf Astoria at the end of the century. So this is New York. We're looking at Rick Presbyterian Church, 
We're seeing it was a conflict for the architect who built it. It was part of the, it was the new version of the old Presbyterian church, which was brick on Wall Street, but brownstone was in. You could see all those brownstone fronts. So the architect really had to work hard to make a melange of brownstone and brick. And he built this Presbyterian church, which was here for a very long time until it moved up to 93rd and Park. Uh, that's about where it is today. What you can see is now the magnet of Fifth Avenue is pulling everybody to the north. And as it pulls everybody to the north, the less expensive properties that radiate out from Fifth Avenue become middle class and then working class as they get closer and closer to the two rivers. So you can see it's a pretty brown world with high stoops and not much variety within the brownstone mode. You all will remember, I'm sure, that both Edith Wharton and Henry James hated the brownstone uh, row houses of New York City and felt they were an embarrassment compared to cities of Europe, which they were now beginning to see. The Doyon who took over, so to speak, society after tiny Belmonts, she uh, ended up with a very sick daughter and took herself out of the social world and now we're getting newer and pushier people coming towards the city. They're making money, they're buying row houses, and they kind of want to be part of the old Knickerbocker crowd, but the Knickerbocker crowd wants nothing to do with it. And one of the ways that they could show their independence, if you're a Knickerbocker, was to join something called Mrs. Astor's Circle, or the dances known as the Patriarchs. This is Caroline Skirmahorn Astor. Not a very attractive woman. Uh, she had a very unhappy marriage. She was married to an Astor, but she was a Skirmahorn. So the real heart of Dutch society uh, who owned a lot of property, which would make her in her old age, her husband left her nothing. Uh, but it didn't matter because the Skirmahorns had huge properties that were being developed by the time she died in 1980. So we see her all dressed up here because she is going to have parties in her house. And this is her brownstone on 34th, the north corner of 34th Street. And this is Anchor House 2. What the Astors decided to do, they had a big property. It went from 27th to 35th Street, from 5th to 6th Avenues, and they wanted to rent out their properties. How to do it? To put their son, to put the two sons of William B. Astor on either corner on 33rd and 34th Streets, give them a nice house, and they would lure fellow renters and eventually sell to the people who came to be near them. And that's exactly what happened. Mrs. Astor's house is here. You can see her ballroom right behind it. Uh, and you can see looking down the street, how many houses were able to be rented for the Astor estate, creating a great form of wealth for the Astor family who were America's richest family just about at this time. Mrs. Astor, pretty much finished her house uh, when this came across, her, across the street from her on the north side of 34th Street, the house of a man who promoted sarsaparilla soft drinks. Samuel Sarsaparilla Townsend built this house. It was pretty awful. Uh, Mrs. Astor probably tried not to look north uh, when she walked on, around her house, uh, but she was saved pretty quickly because Sarsaparilla Townsend went under financially and a major figure in New York City's political and real estate world came in. And that is Alexander Tony Stewart, who was who opened the first department store in America, arguably one of the first department stores in the world. He built this house where uh, the Townsend house had been. Uh, and it was an amazing house. Built it just as the Civil War ends. It's showy again, really showy. It enters on the side. We're looking across 34th Street. It's not entering on Fifth Avenue, even though it's quarter and it's uh, uh, northern side uh, is on Fifth Avenue itself. It's a huge house. He built it with his own stone from a mill, he, from a stone quarry he had in Westchester, but he called it Pont Stone, the wonderful Norman stone, which actually was lining some of the walls inside. Now, why did Stuart do this? Uh, he was a great holder of property. He was very big in the grant uh, world. He was bi big in the uh, Democratic Party in New York. Why did he do this house? He and his wife, who was an old Knickerbocker, had two or three children, neither of, neither of whom survived childhood. So it's just he and his wife in this house. What in the world was that about? 
Mrs. Astor, I guess, thought it was better than what had been there before. But as she pointedly remarked, he sold her the carpets for her house, but she would never invite him to walk upon them. This area, 34th, we're looking at the two Astor houses and at the park between them now, and we're watching General Grant's funeral. Uh, the uh, 34th Street area was kind of the top of the magnet at this point. The city's come up to this place. A.T. Stewart's house is here. Uh, what did he intend to do with it? Well, maybe this. Stewart had a very good eye. He actually bought art. Well, short of John Taylor Johnston, he was the only person in New York City who bought notable paintings. And interestingly enough, he bought paintings and sculpture, and he bought American as well as European paintings. Uh, the collection was wonderful. This is his painting gallery in that house. Maybe Stewart had thought that as we had no municipal museum at this point, that at his death, the museum might be, the uh, collection in the house might be New York City's first museum. This didn't happen. It became a political club and was torn down very quickly. Here we are looking at Mrs. Astor again. She was far from a beauty, but she was married to an Astor who were two generations down now, so somewhat respectable, certainly rich. She's a Knickerbocker. Her husband goes off to climb the sea or sail the seas with women and alcohol, uh, and she stays home, so she's got a pretty unhappy life. Not very beautiful. In fact, she was very sallow-faced, it was said. She was picked up by this fellow. This is Ward McAllister, a sycophantic social climber, uh, eager to enrich himself by creating a society that he could secretly run and get kicked back from, but he needed a front person and so he dubbed Mrs. Astor his mystic rose. She was anything but Dante-esque. And what the two of them did is set up a society where they made the rules on who got in and who did not. And here is Ward McAllister with ass's ears uh, showing America how you should look. It's the stiff figure in the British guard you see on the right. And there's Uncle Sam in his chair laughing hysterically uh, as he sees how un-American and how coarse, in fact, everybody caught on toward McAllister soon enough. Uh, but for a while, he did rule the roost. So here we see the Astor House, the Stewart House. No Stewart in Astor's events, but, <coughs> but he didn't care. Women did. This is the first woman to bash her way in. This is Marietta Stevens, the uh, widow of a hoteler, a woman who was born to a grocer in Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, but pushed her way into the American upper class by marrying off her green-eyed daughter, that's Minnie in the other screen, uh, who she married off to a British minor nobility figure, uh, claiming to be very rich back in New York, which she wasn't. But she married a daughter off, and even in her last days, tiny Belmont came over to say hello to Mrs. Stevens when her daughter's wedding was announced. This enabled Minnie Stevens to get into the patriarchs, into society as the city roared to the north. So the city had very unclean water. How did the water get better with the Croton Reservoir, uh, which ran between 40th and 42nd Street in a big granite Egyptoid looking base. It's really wonderful. And this is where clean water was in New York City until Central Park creates the next clean water uh, area. And here we see Fifth Avenue from the north looking down. You can see the rows of the brownstones with their high stoops and identical uh, doorknobs and identical doors. They were all wonderfully polished Santa Domingan mahogany with silver plated doorknobs and silver plated door hinges. And it was said that if a man had a little too much to drink and went up the stairs, Steps he might well bring up uh, and awaken the butler in the house next door. It was pretty hard to know whose house you were in. Uh, so the conformity is still here. And here we see the uh, 100th anniversary of American independence. This is 1889. And they're going by the granite reservoir, the Croton Reservoir. But it's still a pretty conventional world. It will change. People are getting richer. Newer families are coming in. Social pressure is coming in. Maybe having some connection to some European 
form of aristocracy is, a, aristocracy is a good thing. And what we're looking at is that same area, but we're seeing it now as it becomes the Easter parade, as all these men here in their high hats are walking northward as the city proceeded to go. We're up in the Latting Observatory Tower now, which had the first patented safety elevator. And we're looking down at the Croton Reservoir and at how far below us the city is, because it's barely up to 42nd Street at this point. You can see how much grass there is. Part of the reason there's so much grass on the left side of the Croton Reservoir here is because some people bought property on Fifth Avenue before Fifth Avenue was even laid out. And so when they laid out the street, the calculations were wrong. And so several of the families found themselves with a huge grassy front yard when Fifth Avenue actually came up to them. And one of them actually had a very nice gesture. New York was colder at that time period and ice skating was a very popular uh, pastime. And so what he would do when the winter started upon uh, this part of the city, what he would do is throw buckets of water out on the grass and everybody ice skated on his front lawns. Uh, what we're gonna see now is how the city is going to change and how it is going to pull its way northward even more quickly. It is said that this was done by bringing all the supplies you needed for the next run of row houses that the speculators are gonna build one block ahead of where they were actually building the houses so that you would get the supplies just one block up and then a few uh, the next year you would start in on that block. And so New York City was still row house brownstones creeping northward, but it's about to get a big change. The convention uh, that we've been looking at up until this point will go away because the new people who are coming in and want to get accepted, even if they bought a brownstone, it didn't help. Why, why, why is the house so important? In the early days of business in New York City, over there, He's gonna, yeah, in the early days of business in New York City, you only worked from home. You didn't trust anybody other than your family. Uh, so uh, everybody, you had to have the house. The house told people how rich you were or how successful you were and how many family members were with you and how your family members were going to work for you. Uh, so the house was very important. By this point, we're going to see that the house becomes a social uh, wand to transform the uh, life of the regular citizens who've now got money into acceptance by New York City's well-to-do. New York kind of looks like this. And these houses established the people who were the core of New York society. Uh, but there were people who wanted to get in. And what are we going to do about that? Uh, we're going up the, in the 40s now. This is Jay Gould, the scourge of Wall Street. This is his house. Uh, but you can see how see the brownstone rows going down east on 47th Street. As you look at this house, you can see how conventional and why Edith Wharton might find this boring. Next. And across the street was the Wendell House. This was an early partner and sort of uh, uh, relative of the Astors. Uh, and this is one of the last houses. The houses of the Brownstones of the 40s go down by 1900 or so. But this house stays till 1943. It is the longest staying house on Fifth Avenue. And the Wendell family, who go through four generations here, never electrified it, never bought new clothes, they just stayed in old Knickerbocker fashion in this house until the last Wendell died. Now we're going up on, actually, this is actually Madison Avenue, now being laid out past the Dutch Reformed Church. But our goal is the 50s. And what you can see is how empty it is. You can see the Lazio, the rock formations are on the right of the slide. Uh, we're going up the avenues, but it wasn't exactly hospitable ground. But we're going up to 57th Street where nobody went. The reason we're going up there is a Jones woman. There were three, later two of them. Mary Mason Jones, who you all may know from Edith Wharton's novel. She's Mrs. Mingott in uh, her books. Uh, she's an aunt of Edith Wharton and a corpulent woman who inherited her father along with her sister. She and her sister inherited from their father, John Mason, who started the Chase Bank. But they inherited a little Buchanan farm property that went from 55th Street to 62nd Street, 5th to Lenox, or 5th to Lex, which uh, Chase bought in 1835 for $5,000 whole Mary Mason Jones and her sister, Rebecca Mason Jones, 
moved from Chamber Street, right down here by the museum, up to Waverly Place. And when Waverly Place began to be overrun with businesses, they said, we're not moving anymore. And we're going up to Dan's property and we're gonna make an anchor property again. And so Mary Mason Jones built this set of French houses that went from 57th to 58th Street, putting herself in the front window in this house here, where she watched New York go through all the shanties, goats, rocks, et cetera. It was her view that New York City would come to her by the time she reached old age. And she didn't have to go anywhere because she was already planted here. And that's exactly what happened. Well, there we go. That's the house. Uh, she tried to rent out the other houses. It didn't work very well. Uh, but she did develop block after block uh, on the Buchanan farm, on the Mason farm. Her sister did it a different way. They all loved Paris. The Knickerbocker Society women, Caroline Sturmhorn, Astor, uh, the Jones women, etc., went to Paris every spring. They spent the spring months in the Rue Saint-André. Uh, and here we see Rebecca Jones, sister of Mary Mason Jones, doing the same thing, but with a slightly tamer version of a French style building. There was nothing here when the Mason Jones women set these houses up and New York City came to them within 15 years. Way above the city, but just below the Mason Jones, was this peculiar set of buildings. On the right, we see the Lennox, the beginnings of St. Luke's Hospital, the Episcopalian Hospital, but it's across the street that we're looking. We're looking at a strange house uh, that was built by a man for reasons unknown. Here it is. Uh, it's way above the city, as you can see. It's 42nd Street that you see in a dim background. There's nothing between that area and the uh, Williams house that you see here. Because the house was alone, it had windows on all sides. Uh, he sells this house in the just about six years after he builds it, and he's pretty mysterious. Uh, about six years later, he sells the house to Arabella Warsham, uh, a, a woman with an illegitimate child and a boyfriend who was Collis P. Huntington, the man of the Great Western Railroads. The child was probably Collis Huntington's child, but there was a problem. There was a Mrs. Huntington. And so even though he moves his mistress and the child to New York City. He doesn't want to be seen around them while his wife's alive. So he buys this house way above the city where nobody else would see him when he'd come calling by because nobody lived there, it's empty. And so what he did was get the house for Arabella Worsham. She called herself Worsham. Uh, he got the house for her and she traded it when he had the great luck a few years later in 1880, Mrs. Huntington died. And when Mrs. Huntington died, he could properly marry Arabella, adopt Archer Milton, now Huntington, who you all may know from uh, the wonderful terrace up on 155th Street. Uh, so uh, they bought, the, they actually traded this house in a very strange real estate deal. And so they buy this house, uh, or they sell this house, or, sorry, I'm doing this wrong. I tried to go too fast. They traded the house to John D. Rockefeller Sr., late of Cleveland. And Rockefeller moved in with his wife and children, even though he moved into this, the most beautiful room in New York City in the 19th century. This is Arabella Warsham's Moorish room in that house at 4 West 54th Street, a really wonderful room. There's something always odd to me about it. John D. Rockefeller was senior was an ardent Baptist, didn't smoke, didn't drink, wouldn't let his son go to Yale or Harvard because he'd meet women who smoked and drank uh, and danced, even worse. Uh, and so he bought this house, but he bought the house from a well-known kept woman with an illegitimate child. Wouldn't you think he would have gutted the house? Wouldn't you think he would have built it interior, built the interiors in a new way? He didn't. He left it exactly as Arabella left it. And this wonderful room and all the other rooms in the house stayed until Mrs. Rockefeller died in 1925. This room is now in the Brooklyn Museum. Okay, that's why we can see it in color. New York still keeps creeping up. Here's some more brownstone rows. On the right, we see St. Patrick's Cathedral now reaching the point where it can be opened in 1879. And on the left, there's a big farm. How in the world could there be a big farm as New York City 
is still moving northward. Aha, this is the Kaiser farm. And the reason it was still there is the block across the street from this farm was the block where a lot of property and the business of Madame Restel took place. Madame Restel, some of you may know, was the primary abortionist in uh, mid 19th century New York. And her presence kept real estate away from this block until she was gracious enough to probably commit suicide, at which point William Henry Vanderbilt raced in and bought that farm and would proceed to create Vanderbilt Alley. Here's William Henry Vanderbilt slumped in his chair slightly on the left. Vanderbilt is this Vanderbilt, the son of the old Commodore, uh, was the first Vanderbilt who actually took on Fifth Avenue with a very nice house on 40th and 5th. In 1877, the Commodore died. And when he did, most of the money and most of the property went to William Henry, who had succeeded in getting his father's confidence. With that huge amount of money, the Vanderbilt family, William Henry, and his ambitious children, who you see all dressed up to go to the opera in this painting, uh, took on the idea of moving to grander new palatial houses on Upper Fifth Avenue on the side of that farm. Remember how everybody in the first half of this talk, everybody was very big on conventional materials. Everybody had the same thing. Everybody's house looked the same. The clothes looked the same. Uh -uh. Now we're going to see everybody try to stand out. And so what William Henry does is build himself a double house, and here you see it here, for himself and later his two married daughters in the north half, his daughter-in-law Alva above, and the rest of the Vanderbilts on the west side of Fifth Avenue, creating, as I mentioned before, Vanderbilt Alley. This is the house of his daughter-in-law, who was the next really ambitious social uh, climber in New York City, Alva Erskine Smith, Vanderbilt, who built what was probably the nicest house built on Fifth Avenue. This is the house by Richard Morris Hunt by an actual architect. It's different, the materials are different, uh, and it is probably the house that nobody made any effort to save any of these houses, they all go down. But probably the most important one to have saved was this one, uh, built by an architect, built beautifully, built with wonderful uh, materials, uh, wouldn't it have been wonderful to have had this house survive? Nestled among the brownstones, this particular house made Alva Smith very important, and everybody wanted to go in to see her house because it was said to again have cone stone uh, 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 walls and to have gold fixtures in the bathroom. And here she is. This is Alva Vanderbilt, uh, dressed up in a, after a picture by Cabanal. She's putting on a party, and this party is going to thrust her into the main part of New York society and kind of say, eat your heart out, Mrs. Astor, I'm here. Uh, and she did so. And this big party in March of 1883 ushered in the new rich New York, where everybody did all they could to make themselves different from their neighbors below them and above them. She did this with her brother-in-law. This is Cornelius Vanderbilt II. And Alice, uh, his wife, they're dressed up for the costume party. The costume party has come back. Uh, as you can see, it's very popular with Victoria's court at this time, so it comes back into New York. And here we see them all dressed up. And they go to these balls, which start at night, and they dance. They, they do these things called quadrilles. And the quadrilles are really kind of folk dances, or square dances. But I think it's always to avoid conversation. You do these practiced, long, lengthy dances, and then you never have to talk to the other people assembled there for the ball. The image of these glittering knights with these beautiful women dancing while their rich husbands stand nearby appealed to all the new money. And in this wonderful Charles Dana Gibson cartoon, needs several of them. We see a sort of coarse new money woman and her rather thin little slight husband trying to literally sledgehammer their way into New York society. Born in that house was Consuelo Vanderbilt, who mom set up to propel her to the top of New York and America's society. Actually a rather interesting woman she lived in that house in a, and her mother dressed her every morning in a steel corset with a head device that kept her head high so that she would develop a very aristocratic looking long neck. She played the piano. She was very 
able in French and German. And she was set up to marry a very important person, which her mother feigned death, fear, murder in order to get her to do. She had a boyfriend. Her future husband had a boyfriend, but Alva wouldn't let that happen. She made the biggest marriage of the century. She thrust Consuelo in tears on the ninth Duke of Marlborough, who wasn't any happier either, in a big wedding. And here we see them. This is Alva's long-necked Consuelo. And there's the much shorter Duke of Marlborough with the heir and the spare, a very miserable marriage, which Alva, by the way, will recant later on. In the 1920s, Alva admitted what she did. And she and Consuelo, of all things, became suffragettes. In fact, the suffragette building in Washington, D.C. was paid for by Alva uh, in the late uh, 1920s. The wedding at St. Thomas's Church uh, was attended by all of New York, who you see here around the big tent that's leading to the entrance. Alva, uh, the daughter, cried through the wedding. Uh, the Duke was pretty happy when he signed the deed uh, for the stock he was going to get that morning. New York all turned out to see this because New York newspapers reported on every detail of her wardrobe, every detail of her life. Every, society was absolutely, totally uh, in uh, the, the source of joy to the poor people who worked hard for barely uh, a living in the New York of the day. So here they are, turned out to see this royal wedding. Everybody was there except Vanderbilt's. By this point, Alva had divorced the Vanderbilt family, and she didn't even invite them to the wedding. The sisters of Alva, sister-in-laws of Alva, have all the houses going to the north. And in the entranceway to the double house of William Henry, uh, he bought at the 1880s sale the Demidoff uh, vase. You see here a huge Russian-made uh, Malachite vase now in the Metropolitan Museum. So you can see they're putting all the prizes they can get their hands on in a sale in Paris in 1880 to fill this house to make themselves look like an American aristocracy, even if they were created from fresh ground. William, Henry, uh, William Henry's house also had the latest style. Japan was cool, thanks to Admiral Perry. And this is William Henry Vanderbilt's very poor, poorly understand, understood aesthetic of Japan, his Japanese room in his mansion. You could see that a Japanese person would probably be quite sickened by the sight. The last of the Vanderbilt children, the uh, namesake son, Cornelius II, built this house, which, like the Stewart house, had an entrance on the side street. It was a brick uh, and stone house uh, and didn't enter actually on Fifth Avenue. Uh, within a few years, the Vanderbilts and everybody else in this industrial class become pretty rich. And then when, that, when this happens, the Vanderbilts buy out the brownstones that you see there on the right and extend the house. So we see all... This is the uh, St. Gordon's fireplace, but I want to go up to the next one. There we go. And they extend the house all the way to 58th Street. So the Cornelius house goes from 57th to 58th Street with this little court uh, uh, yard in front and a uh, lovely area with carriage uh, uh, covering so that when there were balls in the house, people would come through the 58th Street entry. Not only did Cornelius extend the house at this time, but Alva's own son on the wonderful Richard Morris Hunt actually hired, of all people, McKim Eden White, exactly what that means, I don't know, in 1906 to build an addition on the Petit Chateau on the Alva house, which was really an irony because this, how long do you think this lasted? 11 years. So everybody got bigger and better, but it was over. Here's the house with the addition. This is the Petit Chateau with the addition. What we're looking at now is Central Park. Okay, so now Fifth Avenue, thanks to the Vanderbilts, thanks to Cornelius Vanderbilt's house on 58th Street, we're getting closer to the wilds that are about to become Central Park. This is 59th Street. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is 1859. And what we're looking at is that the top building there is St. Luke's Hospital. And we're seeing the emptiness that's going to become tamed for Central Park and become on the east side of Fifth Avenue, home to the next generation of Fifth Avenue residents. This is the first house across from the park. Uh, this is a little thin house by Jacob Ray Mould, as I am told he was preferred to be, uh, his name was preferred to be pronounced. Uh, it was lonely in the middle of the block. That was the cheapest 
property to build on, and it did not survive a big windstorm. But very quickly, other row houses will come up on Fifth Avenue now with a permanent view because they've got the park. And so we see that these, even though this is a spec built uh, set of row houses to one family, even though that's happening, what we see is that they're no longer brownstones and they're no longer identical, that they're new styles and new sizes. They're much more potential, or they're much more pretentious rather. Now we could keep going. Sometimes people bought the property and sometimes the property didn't sell. And so the property prices were spectacular. And so what you see are these fences, these hoardings, which really quickly get laden with signs from advertisers. But what this simply means is that property is waiting to be built by another speculator or family. Next. Oh, here's Mrs. Astor. Okay. So what does Mrs. Astor do when all when the Vanderbilts are building bigger and better? What does she do? Well, she reacts to her nephew. Mrs. Astor got on well with her brother-in-law and sister-in-law. But their child, Lord, who is about now to move to England and become Lord Astor of Hever, doesn't like Aunt Caroline. And so on his family property, on that anchor baby property. He built the Waldorf Hotel, which you see looming over Mrs. Astor's house. What does that leave? Poor Mrs. Astor, now lonely, now uh, her, her world is pretty much gone. What does that leave her? No choice but, next, to do this, to copy of all people, Mrs. Vanderbilt and Mrs. Vanderbilt's own architect. And she built a double house on 65th Street, and here we see the double Vanderbilt house. Uh, so all everybody gets into this stunning new glory of the Gilded Age. This is the interior. Mrs. Astor gets uh, dementia uh, and dies, and here we see her in her Corolla store, with her Corolla Duran painting uh, draped in mourning cloth. Oddly enough, by the time this Mrs. Astor, the Mrs. Astor dies, it is said that most of the furniture is fake, that the rows of her long pearls included fakes. And oddly enough, even though, as I've mentioned before, her husband didn't leave her any money at all, left it to the children, her Scrimmerhorn properties made her exceedingly rich. But what we're seeing here is a very dull version of what the houses on Fifth Avenue were going to look like for the rest of the Gilded Age. Next. Brownstones continue. Brownstones on the block, more next. More uh, sites awaiting development. Next, please. There we go. We come up to this point. This is uh, a wonderful house uh, built by Mr. Schicko for the Stewart, for Robert Stewart, who was another of those Scottish guys, along with Lennox and a few others. And what he did was bring steam engines to making sugar cheaper. So uh, he made candy for America possible, made a lot of money. He also bought a lot of paintings. Uh, he had this house built on 67th Street, but he died before he could move in. Uh, Mrs. Stewart moved, this is S-T-U-A-R-T, this Mrs. Stewart moved in, and there was a big controversy about where her paintings were going to go. And in the end, she wanted, they were supposed to go to the Metropolitan Museum, but the Metropolitan Museum wanted to be open on Sundays because that's the only day working class people could go to the museum. She was a devout Presbyterian, so she didn't leave her paintings to the men. When she died, the house was sold next to the stock waterer of all time, William Collins Whitney, who hired Stanford White, who transformed that house into this house. And this is my number two contender for the house that should have been saved. This house, believe it or not, survived till the early years of World War II, when unfortunately it went down. Uh, but it's a really wonderful house, which had wonderful treasures inside. Most of them, though, now are in the Metropolitan Museum. What are we doing with the brownstones we're encountering as the city gets to be Gilded Age rich? Well, we're knocking off the porches. We're knocking off the stoop. We're knocking off the detail. We're pulling the house back into the deep part of the yard. We're punching holes in it so that you have light wells and putting a Bozar designed facade on the house. So when you're looking at the houses of the Upper East Side, the grand houses that are often today, uh, embassies and that sort of thing, they actually have that core. They just built up and built around it, as you see here. Next.
Okay. The last one of the last of the big houses was uh, Andrew Carnegie, whose wife, after ten years, produces a daughter. She wanted her daughter to have a yard. This is the yard. Uh, he had to have a house as big with as big a garden as his somewhat partner and rival Henry Clay Frick had. So we see these two houses kind of fighting to be the biggest and to have the biggest greenery on Fifth Avenue. Next. Okay. Frida Schiff got her, war, got her uh, wish. When she married Felix Warburg, she built a small version of the Fletcher House on 94th Street, which many of you may know today as one of the few survivors as the Jewish Museum. Next. The last of these houses is this one. It's the daughter of William Collins Whitney, Dorothy uh, Whitney, who marries an interesting man. She marries a man called Willard Strait, who did not come from this world at all, whose family were missionaries in the East, who lived in Asia, who learned Asian languages as he was a young man in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, went to work for the US government. He was a highly regarded future man of importance. He married a rich woman. This is perfect. They build this much more tame, conventional looking house, uh, the last of the houses on Fifth Avenue. And he goes over to Paris to sign the end of World War I papers and gets the Spanish flu and dies. And so this is kind of the end of the houses. Next. And the end of the era. Those costume balls, all the money they were spending, all the place they made, instead of being something that was going to employ the new people who were coming here as immigrants, now it was seen as excessive bad taste. It was awful. A lot of the families had to move to Europe because there was a party that was so elaborate and so overdone, as you can see here in these footmen waiters that you're looking at, uh, that the family had to leave New York. Uh, and so it comes to an end around World War I and gets pulled down without a shedding of tears. There are no recollections about, darn it, our house is going down. What did Consuelo feel when she watched both Alva and Consuelo watch their own house go down and nobody cares? Uh, it's over. They live in Greenwich. There, we, we see other places, uh, the Hamptons in the summer, uh, the Adirondacks in the heart of summer. Uh, people's grandchildren are now in Europe. And so this whole era comes to a sudden cataclysmic end and it is all over and we didn't save very much of it at all. Thank you all. And um, it would be anticlimactic for me to say anything more than <laughs> Mosette than just thank you so much for really a, 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 a breathtaking <laughs> and a breathless <laughs> race <laughs> of the avenue. So um, it was just a wonderful history. I'm gonna hold the book up here because uh, the book can be rather difficult to, to yes, get, but you is. can get it right here at the Skyscraper Museum, the store of the Skyscraper Museum. So you can check online uh, for under not just Fifth Avenue, but Arch Fifth Avenue Architecture and Society, the history of America's street of dreams. And we really had a dreamy lesson tonight in the, in, the, in the glory of Fifth Avenue. So thanks everybody for joining Thank us you. tonight. Thank okay, you. See you next time. Thank you.